So as I mentioned, I also have the pleasure and the privilege of being the moderator for today's opening panel, during which I'll be joined by three incredible colleagues. Today, we'll be discussing what we see unfolding here in the United States with respect to, let's not mince words, the attack on equity. And I'll be honest with all of you. This is a very important conversation, and I have struggled to find the right language for the conversation. What are we experiencing? Are we facing headwinds in our equity work? No, that makes it sound like things aren't happening by design, like it's just a natural phenomenon. Is it about polarization or division in the US? Well, we know that our country and many other countries around the world are very polarized. But that's not exactly what we're talking about here either, as that uh, implies, as, as our panelists have reminded us many times over the past few months, that uh, people with, a, you know, when you're talking about pol polarization, that implies people with a range of political perspectives are having a hard time finding common ground to achieve a vision of the future. So that's not exactly what we're talking about here either. Having had many conversations with folks across the field and very specifically with our three panelists today, I am compelled to name this what it is. We're living in a moment where the idea of a full multiracial democracy is under attack. A multiracial democracy living in a country where regardless of who you are, people of all races and all forms of identities are safe. All people are recognized as equal members of communities where individuals are treated fairly and individuals are equally represented, where social equity is experienced by all members of our society. This is the vision for America that we are striving for and that's under attack. And we know that this threat to democracy and attack on equity is not only here in the United States. Equity work, racial equity, gender equity, equity for LGBTQIA plus and trans folks in the US is under a systematic coordinated attack. This is what we mean when we say democracy is under attack. We see this at the federal level, such as the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action, not only the ruling itself for higher education, but also the chilling effects that it has had across the country such as with nonprofits and the private sector, well beyond the jurisdiction of the ruling itself. So for example, these chilling effects are causing people with programs designed for people of color to fear getting sued. Uh, you may have heard of the Fearless Fund case out of Atlanta. And as a result, people are changing their programming to be more broad. These changes not required by law, but based on the real fear, the fear of being sued. As a small nonprofit with limited resources, that risk is real. This is not only happening in red, red states. Nonprofits in places like California or Massachusetts are making these shifts due to the risk as well. And this is what we mean when we say that there's a chilling effect. We see this in policies passed at several states, for example, restricting the rights of trans people, banning books, restricting the use of the term DEI, state policy offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion being closed at public universities. And we see at local levels, school boards and city councils, places where local communities are not uh, allowed to apply for federal funding if the funding opportunity has equity in its name or description, places where community school boards have banned social emotional learning. And for some folks, this feels different than where we were in 2020 and 21, when many individuals, organizations, and companies were making commitments to racial equity, motivated in part by the disparities that were laid bare during COVID, in part by the media coverage and movement work after the highly visible murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other Black Americans. People who previously refused to see this reality were given no choice. But this widespread support for equity doesn't seem like where we are today in 2024. And yet we at the Collective Impact Forum and you here with us this week, we are committed to this work. 
many individuals and organizations are committed. We have to remain committed to this work in spite of these challenges. And there's not a better group to discuss these challenges and explore ways that communities can respond than the three people joining me today. These three panelists joining me are members of the Collective Impact Forum family, and all three are real mentors to me, so I am honored to be in conversation with them today. I'll provide a brief introduction to each and encourage you to please uh, learn more about all three by reading their bios in Whova uh, or on their organization's websites. So first joining me is Monique Miles. Monique is a vice president of the Aspen Institute, director of the Opportunity Youth Forum and managing director of the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions. Prior to joining the Forum uh, for Community Solutions, Monique held positions at the National Youth Employment Coalition, Youth Opportunity Boston, and the Commonwealth Corporation. Monique serves on the board of Independent Trust and the Jeremiah Program. Hey, Monique, welcome. Next, we welcome Paul Schmitz. Paul is a senior advisor to the Collective Impact Forum and CEO of Leading Inside Out. Over the past seven years, he's worked with collective impact efforts across the U.S., on building better strategy and culture. He is also the author of Everyone Leads, Building Leadership from the Community Up, and the former CEO of Public Allies, where he helped more than 5,000 diverse young adults begin careers working for community and social change. Finally, uh, last but not least, Junius Williams. Junius is also a senior advisor to the Collective Impact Forum and the principal of Junius Williams Consulting a firm specializing in research, policy analysis, collaboration facilitation, program development, and assessment focused on increasing equity and social justice. He has worked over the last 25 years on a variety of multi-stakeholder, multi-sector collaborations and collective impact efforts providing guidance and support in design, implementation, facilitation, management, and program improvement for initiatives spanning from full service community schools to cradle and career pathways, from opportunity youth education and employment to improving outcomes for boys and men of color. So welcome Monique, Paul and Junius. So I wanna start just by asking, why do you think it's important that we have this conversation now with the people on this call? Why does this matter to all of us? And I am going to start with you, Monique, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? You're perfect. Thank you. Thank you for this question. It's important to have this conversation now for all of the reasons you articulated in that opening, Jen. Our democracy is under attack. And as leaders like Michael McAfee at PolicyLink remind us, we all must have a founder's orientation in doing the work to ensure that the all vision of our democracy comes to fruition. Our country, our, our country, states, communities, and families, including our children, are under attack. And as we stand, deeply anchored in the present, organizing to win on our vision of a multiracial democracy, we have to remember how present history is, even in this very moment of now. As Nicole Hannah-Jones reminds us, history is not only in the past, it is ever-present. And the reason why history is ever-present is because history has shaped the very systems, laws, and policies that create the current context and culture we live in today, especially the laws that decade after decade are by design, they are designed to reframe the conversation about race in this country so that any meaningful racial progress by any group that is not white is in opposition to whiteness, to white supremacy, and to white patriarchy. This conflict has existed since slavery during Reconstruction and even in the 60s and 70s with the passing of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting, right Act, the Voting Rights Act, both of which were gutted first by Nixon and then ultimately by Reagan in the 80s. Time and time again, we bore witness to the passage of federal, state, and local laws that are not only deeply racist, they serve to further fracture our democracy, like the Rockefeller drug laws of the 70s and 80s, which served as our country's designed pivot into mass incarceration. Fast forward to the opioid crisis, which I lift up with lots of love, care, and reverence for the individuals and families impacted, and to share that when the who of who was impacted with the opioid crisis was clear, the response was the opposite of criminalizing addiction. 
there was a coordinated care response centered around compassion and accountability. So when we talk about affirmative action or Roe versus Wade or anti-DEI laws, we have to contextualize these strategies into a broader historical context and perspective of time, because we've seen these strategies before. We know the impact that they have on our communities, most especially our vulnerable places. The impact by design is intergenerational. Most importantly, there are historical lessons to be shared on how to tactically organize, and we must continue our freedom dreaming. You see, Freedom dreaming is at its heart about our ability to organize not just a multiracial vision of democracy, but a democracy that's built on solidarity, mutuality, and a shared collective vision for humanity. Because once we do that, we can solve so many more challenges. That's why it's important to have this conversation now. Yes, Monique, thank you so much for grounding us in where we've been in the history that gets us here and why it is as important as ever. So thank you for that. Junius, what would you like to bring into the conversation? Welcome. Well, thanks for coordinating uh, this, Jen. And um, I really appreciate the, the initial framing that, um, that you did and the augmenting of it that, um, that Monique just did. I, I guess for me, I, I would just kind of reiterate some points there. There is this attack on equity that's part of a, a larger attack on democracy. But what's most frightening is what's being proposed in this is minority rule that just makes me shiver. And it's abandonment of democratic principles that you see not only in polling, but in discussions uh, with folks. And that that what's going on is a really well-financed, well-coordinated uh, effort to really shift the mindset of people in this country about what the commitment is to that multi-racial uh, democracy and to have people begin to question how we go about rectifying the past. And one of the things that's most concerning to me is the Assault on equity for me means we're never going to achieve equality. Given the his history of how we've discriminated whenever we found difference in this society, there's no way to get to equality without equity because we have to repair the harm that's going on. And this assault on even talking about equity is saying that we are no longer going to pursue an agenda uh, around equality. Um, I am experiencing, as I talk to people, or they are experiencing folks trying to do this work, a great deal uh, of sort of trepidation. They've invested so much in moving the equity agenda, and now they're in almost a state uh, uh, of suspense. I think one of the things that makes this a timely discussion is people got a lot of decisions to make, right? People have to make personal decisions about their commitment, their risk tolerance, because this is going to be a rough road ahead. This is like the third reconstruction that we're entering, and it is about race, and it is about like ignoring the history that got us here and preventing us from achieving the future that we owe to people, that we're on the precipice of doing, and that's why the resistance is so difficult. So folks need to make some personal decisions. There need to be some organizational decision-making, not the fluff that we uh, experience in the so-called period of reckoning uh, in the post-murder uh, period with um, George Floyd and so, but a real organizational commitment to what are you gonna do? How are you gonna get your house in order? How are you gonna remain committed? But the collaboratives need to make some decisions too. those people who've gotten together. Um, and most importantly, communities have to make a decision because if communities are not supportive of an agenda of pursuing equity, we ain't going to get there. And I'm talking about grassroots, the grass tops to the elites. People have to come together. And these collaboratives that we have through collective impact are one setting in which those discussions uh, can occur. So that's why for me, this is really important. And we're on a place where we may be close to a point of no return on this. And that's what frightens me most and gives me a sense of urgency that 
all of us need to get our heads right about where we are on these issues, our organizations and institutions, and then we need to fight like hell. Final point, I have a sense having been in some form of this struggle my entire life, I feel like we're in retreat. I don't like to retreat. And I understand the need for a strategic retreat, but my feeling is that's not what was going on now. And it goes back to what Monique just said. There are some lessons from history and movement building that for some reason we aren't applying to the current set of situations that we absolutely need to do so that we have some offense. I realize that sometimes we're going to resist, sometimes we're going to retreat, but if we ain't got no offense, then we're going to lose this battle because it can't be holding the current state because the current state for so many people is not satisfactory. There's mm -hmm. too much oppression, too much discrimination, too much isolation of people. So this is not a state that I want to live the remainder of my life or leave to my kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. Junius, thank you for that. That. Uh already starting with our calls to action. And I'm, I'm going to want to come back to what more of that means for folks on this call. But let me bring Paul into the conversation. And Paul, what is important to you in this moment? Why are we having this conversation now? And you are on mute. So just a heads up. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Monique and Junius. I think that the, the context of and history of white supremacy, which I think Monique walked through, and just how it, you know, policies and impacts we've had were designed. They were built that way. Systems weren't accidental. They were actually designed to produce the results that we have. And the 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 concern about minoritarian rule and and the fact that we have to be on offense, I think all of those are, are incredibly important. There are three things that I, I think about specific to collective impact. The first is that the, the work we do is to move some type of population level change in whatever community we're in. If we're trying to move systems changes to improve outcomes for populations. And I think one of the key lessons we've all learned is you can't move population change unless you address disparities within population. And so there really isn't a way to get to population change without having equity in the center of the work and thinking about how do we address the disparities that are probably the largest block on moving population change. And so it's critical to everyone doing collective impact to have a frame that, that centers this work. I think secondly is this, is this context in which we do our work, whether you're working in education or public health or whatever, the forces that have supported minoritarian rule, the forces that have supported white supremacy policy are the forces that have also been anti-public health, anti-economic development, anti-education, uh, mm -hmm. anti, you know, so if you are working in these issues, these forces will affect. And, you know, Heather McGee, who spoke at our, our summit a couple of years ago, who wrote The Sum of Us, writes about how so much of policy, and this is true history, there were group people who kind of, you know, they drain the swimming pool rather than integrate the swimming pool so that no one could swim, right? And, and that's a metaphor for a whole host of policies. And so you have to think about the context in which you're doing your work on education or health or the environment or safety or whatever, that, that, that larger context matters to the work you do. And so you can say, well, I, I, don't, I work on this issue in this community, but if the policies that come down from the state, from the federal that are influenced by these conversations have huge impact on everyone's ability to do this work. So I think those, those are two. And the third is just, it has been a sudden shift. Uh, 2020, 2021 was a lot, there was a lot of cosmetic and performative equity at the same time, it was a moment where it felt like we were playing some level of offense. And I think that's why the backlash has been so sudden and severe. And I think those forces were always there. I mean, we saw in the previous administration, there was already an effort to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion training. There were, uh, you know, and I mean, we can go back to the rhetoric and everything else. And I think the thing we have to remember is that for people 
trying to address these issues in a local level at a state level that it's there's a national narrative that has empowered and enabled people locally and at state levels to drive this and there's a national media infrastructure that is supporting and enabling people to oppose this work and so as Junia said, we have to go on offense. We have to be willing to play offense and, and think of that. So those are just some some of my initial thoughts about why we have to do this and, and participate in, in Monique's uh, freedom dreaming. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, and Paul, you were almost starting to go there, but you were talking about a big picture. And then when we think about how this is landing in communities, you know, as a team, we really parsed out that there are different kinds of contexts or situations um, in the way folks are experiencing this on the ground. And one uh, type or archetype, if you will, is where you might have a state where statewide policies are very, we would call it anti-DEI, we can call it racist, we can call it hostile. Um, within those states yet, there are places where people in communities are maintaining their focus on equity and their coalitions are committed to this work. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're seeing in these kinds of places and how coalitions and collaboratives that are committed to this work are working to move forward in this time. Yeah. And maybe Paul, I'll go back to you here. Sure, I mean, I, I, I think it's such an important distinction. So I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, our county executive, which includes the suburbs, just won the highest percentage of the vote ever in the history of the county, something like 89%, running for re-election on a platform of racial equity as being the guiding North Star of the county. And so I live in that county where it's not controversial to do this work, where it's not uh, 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 something we, you know, our, our, our mayor, our county executive, our elected leaders here. Yet I live in a state where we're, on the margin <laughs> of a legislature that uh, definitely would like to ban all of that work and make it very difficult and uh, is trying to pass voting laws and other things that would that are inequitable and are, are have made efforts to ban DI work at the campuses and, and other places. And so I, I have a sensitivity to that, which is different than communities where the community itself is the issue and the local level. And so at the state level, I think the thing that I've seen people talking about that are trying to deal with this in states where they have passed these things is one is building and educating champions, especially in the civic leadership and trying to get some leaders with guts uh, to stand up and to recognize that based on values or perspectives that they have, making sure they understand the data, the case and the necessity of doing this work and building champions who get this and are willing to stand up to the state with uh, organizations and groups. The second thing is to be really clear within coalitions, what the different, what different restrictions on different partners mean and recognizing that some partners legally can't take certain stands or do things and not shame them out of it, but recognize that and recognize that there's others who don't have that limitation and they shouldn't act as if they're limited. And that goes to a third point, which is get legal help. Because one of the things I've experienced for the last 30 years is the nonprofit sector sense what the law allows nonprofits to do in advocacy and lobbying is here. What most nonprofits think they can do on lobbying and advocacy is here. And I've heard so many, oh, we can't do that. You People are so unaware of what they actually can do. And I think as we parse out these laws and rules that are coming down from states, getting really clear about what are the actual boundary lines and being educated on that so you can educate others and you can work with others on those things. Because I think so often we just accept that that means we can't do anything. And then we all act out of fear instead of really understanding the line so we know how to move the line and work the line uh, instead of being afraid of going anywhere near it. So I think we have to get the legal information. I think we just gotta get clarity among different partners about where they can go 
and make sure that those who aren't limited stand up and make the make the points and recognize that some others may not be able to do that and that they don't believe in it. It's that they will lose funding that is vital to children and families' lives if they do, and we don't want them to lose that funding. But we have to be willing to stand up and make sure that other partners stand up and figure out how to manage that within the network instead of expecting everyone to be in the same place. That's right. That would be my 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 thoughts on that. That's right, Paul. And that's very like practical here, you know, things you can be thinking about in your work based on uh, what Paul what Paul's suggesting. Junius, what's coming up for you when you think about kind of the practical on the ground advice in these kind of situations? Um, well, this uh, panel process has been really good for me in terms of having a chance to talk with all of you and crystallize some of my thinking because part of what is emerging for me is I was drawing some distinctions as all of us are between these sort of permissive environments versus the more restrictive and then new initiatives versus uh, ongoing initiatives. But one of the, the things that uh, has occurred to me more recently as I've interacted uh, with folks in California is we need to be concerned about all these environments. The messaging and communications around this assault on equity has been pervasive. It has really impacted people. And again, there's been not very much countervailing messaging from, uh, you know, our side of, of the equation. And I raise that because one of the things that I'm sensing in interaction and that this has done is it's created a permission structure around questioning and challenging. And I, I I, I don't want to frame it exactly that way, but but people are questioning and challenging the basic assumptions that went into a lot of the equity work, even folks who've been doing it for a while. So my first point is that I think tactically it's really important for leaders of uh, collaboratives to do some check-ins with people, uh, to do sort of a support and risk assessment. The messaging has been pervasive and people who are relatively new, as opposed to some of us who've had long-term lifetime commitments to this, those folks are, are concerned right now and uh, uh, their support is a little shaky. And I think it's really important that leadership go around, assess that, find out how people are thinking about this, what their risk tolerance is, uh, what kind of holes people feel in their ability to defend what we're doing uh, uh, in equity. So I think that's the first thing is understanding whether and how people are experiencing hesitancy, resistance, or questioning of this and begin to develop some responses to that so that you don't lose the people that have already come into the circle and are, are trying to do the work. Uh, I'd make two other quick points. One about startups. If I were, as I'm doing in a couple places now, uh, working with folks, but if I were myself doing the startup uh, of an initiative, I would really tie myself um, or tether myself or somehow connect myself solidly to targeted universalism. Because I think there's a framing in that that permits you to defend uh, a targeted uh, uh, action. So that's the first thing is really understanding targeted universalism and the universal goal. That also demands though, that once you establish that universal goal, you have robust disaggregated analysis because I think part of the solution, and I know people who've been committed to racial justice wanna stay focused on that, but one of the positions may be you have to move back and talk about all of the populations that are experiencing uh, disparities and opportunities or representation and, uh, and outcome to help people understand how pervasive 
the discrimination and disparities are. And while they may be really exaggerated given our racial history, they are there for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And that we have the technology and the ability if we really mine our data to understand all of that. But what the targeted universalism does is it gives us a context and would say, okay, here's our universal goal. How does everybody that we're concerned with and all of the subpopulations, how are they relative to that goal? So that's the first step. The second step, and the, the robust analysis of the data are really important here, is to know your backup proxies, right? And the power of various proxies, because sometimes the, the, the strategy, uh, uh, the strategic retreat has to be, I got to go back to proxies. That means you've got to really understand your data and working with data pro, uh, partners to do robust uh, cross-tabular analysis. So if you're moving to geography, you know what you're going to get out of moving your basis to geography. If you move to socioeconomic class, knowing what that's going to yield and what it's not going to yield for you. But I think that part of the solution for folks is in that is tying on and trying to universalize some of this stuff to dance around it because in that context, then you're doing targeted interventions for all of the populations that you've identified and prioritized as experiencing uh, disparities. And it tends to quell it. Quick story, when I was working in Southeast Ohio um, a, a couple of years ago, framing this, and Monique mentioned this, the opiate crisis is say, when you frame that widely, what's happening to suburban young white males? Wow, opiate addiction, uh, emergency rooms, you know, death sort of things. And what you're able to say is, our thing is about this diverse, multiracial society. And we're concerned about any difference in outcome, and we're going to pursue it to understand why it exists and whether and how we have an obligation to remediate that so we're lessening the disparate impact on it. So for me, that's a big part of it. For folks who are starting up, you've got to be careful in how you frame. I think there's some different prescriptions to talk about people who are already there and have a bunch of strategies and interventions that are out there and potentially vulnerable, but I'll stop at this point. Thank you, Junius. Uh, we had a couple questions in the chat. I'll just quickly speak to about clarifying what we mean by proxy and disaggregated data. Some of my colleagues will answer those in the chat, but in, quickly proxy is using a different indicator than, for example, race, if you are not able to use race, what can you do that might get you to a very similar population? Um, uh, and so that's what Junius was referring to And disaggregated data refers to looking at data as it is identified by different um, identity groups, race, gender, and or others, and then looking at how trends might differ when you split the data by those different groupings. Uh, and my colleagues are going to respond with more detail in the yeah. chat. And a quick note, and, don't call them identities. Sorry. People go <laughs> crazy with that I. You understand the point, yeah. Thank you, Junius. Monique, thank you. I know it's been a while since we were able to loop back to you, but I really am oh, eager to hear okay. from you here. Yeah, because this is, oh God, such an important conversation. Um, and I want to connect my response to Paul's framing of how important context is, and Junius specifically weaving that thread around history, like people who have historically been doing this work, because what feels really important to pull out, to be really clear about in this conversation, is that right now we're having a conversation, the messaging is around the word equity, but this is not a language fight, right? This is this is about like the heart of what we're doing is fighting for who gets to belong in our democracy. And every decade, every couple of decades, we 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 we're having a fight that at the center is something about language, but none of this is ever, ever about language. And so it feels really important then when we really understand what the fight is, that then we start organizing our short-term strategies, our short-term game, and our long-term game. We're doing that short-term view and that long-term view because of history, because of the role that history has played, and we should be organizing for, because in 100 and 200 years, here is how we will continue to win, and here is what that fight looks like. And I just want to make sure we're really 
pulling this out because yes, we're talking about anti-DEI or an aversion to um, CRT, but that's not really what this fight is about. So that's one is thinking about your long-term versus your short-term gaming and organizing. The other thing that I want to harken back to part of what Paul was saying about the collaborative is the other thing that we know, like the reason why that offensive strategy that Junius was speaking to is so critical is because when you think about what a collaborative can do and particularly what a collaborative can do in response to the, the literally to play defense, the, the, we could get so exhausted if we are not really organized strategically on who's poised to do what best. So when you start looking at this cross system, cross sector, and who sits where in the ecosystem, organizing your strategy based on which lane people are in, based on what they can do publicly, privately, with the law, with policy, et cetera, also becomes really, really important in organizing our offensive game, as Junius was speaking to. And then the last piece that I want to say is I want to contextualize all of this because we support something called the Texas Opportunity Youth Network um, at the Aspen Opportunity Youth Forum. That work is led by my wonderful esteemed colleague, Dr. Hannah Gorgi. And what we're seeing in Texas is public institutions that are gravely impacted by the state's legislation calling for the elimination of DEI programming and strategies. One example, the University of Texas at Austin released over 60 staff and faculty associated with DEI programming, student organizations associated with racial, religious, and ethnic LGBTQIA identity have also been gutted at public post-secondary institutions across the state. State agencies in Texas, they've eliminated the term equity, racial justice from RFPs, and it's exactly what Paul was saying. This is tied to funding. This is tied to sustainability. This is, this is we know, the trickle down of the impact of these policies, and community collaboratives are integral to what offense looks like at the organizing at the state level, but also locally. So some of what we see are coalitions that are organizing and have shift of focus to do work that's focused very specifically on belonging. And then they have an entire set of accountability metrics that they've put in place to really begin to document and tell that belonging story. We also see coalitions that are leveraging public funding streams specifically to invest in programming for youth and young adults of color health funding being used creatively, WIOA, um, Workforce Investment Act funding being used creatively, even ESSER dollars, thinking about alternative pathways for some youth and uh, young adults of color in communities is also another creative thing that we're seeing. And then the last piece, and I'm so glad that Junius walked through it and really pulled the thread in the way that he should, is targeted universalist approaches. Absolutely. That is one of, I would say, the four most offensive strategies we're seeing collaboratives in places like Texas in places like Montana use because to Junius's point, they can do, they, they can disaggregate to look at who's justice impacted, who is foster care impacted, who are our undocumented students, excuse me, youth and young adults, in ways that then help them get to a lot of what Junius just walked us through. And then finally, there are places that are not changing anything. They are doubling down. They are really clear. We're not giving up on our equity work. And if anything, we're going to broaden and expand it. Now we're doing equity in healing work because we see what you're doing. And we want to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves now intergenerationally. So we're going to continue this equity work. And we're going to be even more strategic and thoughtful about well-being so that our children's children will have an entirely different reality that they're experienced because we're centering well-being, self-care, community, love, and compassion in our oppositional work to the state. So that's a lot of what we're seeing in our network in terms of not just what's happening, but the organizing responses that are helping communities continue this important work. Monique, that's awesome. Thank you. And make big shout out to the opportunity forum and the sites that are so committed to this work across the country and finding themselves in really different um, contexts and learning from each other. So thank you for uplifting all of that. Um, I wanna just ask, and maybe I'll have Paul, you you mentioned sort of the rural urban dynamic that you see in, in your home state of Wisconsin. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing in some of the places where the local context is posing to be the big or proving to be the biggest challenge. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to also thank Monique and Julius and show that this is my note so far on what you all been saying. <laughs> so I just, uh, I really appreciated being part of, of, of this effort with, with two leaders. I, I really have known for a while and admire so much. And, um, so I, I had a couple thoughts here. One is that I think at the low, we always have to understand what is our goal. Is our goal to be recognized uh, by for performatively showing that we care about this stuff and preaching to the people who already care about? Or is our goal to bring more people along into our effort? And I'm speaking at a local level. And I think sometimes what I see is a lot of people kind of circling their own wagons versus trying to build. And I think if I'm in a local community, I've got to have a build strategy. And I think that that is all about the relational. And one of the examples that I think about is, is the marriage equality movement and, and what they learned about moving people to support marriage equality was the number one thing that moves someone is when someone told their story about how they how and why they came to believe it was important. If they came in and tried to explain to someone why the rights matter and like try to give them all the arguments about society, that didn't move people. But literally walking through their story gave people a permission to grow themselves instead of being like starting with like, well, I don't know anything. I'm ignorant and you're calling me ignorant. It was more like, oh, you can actually take a journey. You can do that. And so I think the, the these so-called stories, I think if we're meeting with people in our communities, we're saying, listen, this is how we've come, you know, this is why our coalition came to this. This is why we believe it's important. This is why I believe it's important. This is how I learned that. And like when I started, I didn't know that. And and what one of the things that made me think about as I was reflecting on this question is I was once in a, a city in, in eastern Texas, a small uh, town closer to Louisiana. And um, there was this guy who actually sponsored my visit to this community was a rancher. And he told me his story about how he went from being someone who would have never supported this kind of work to supporting it. And I wanted to put him on every stage in America because his own story of, he said, you know, he talked about the moment where he, in his words, he had to kneel down and, and ask God to forgive him for his racism and like how he converted, like, and I was just like, and I knew, and I knew the people that were part of his journey. And I thought, what if they had just attacked him or argued with him or opposed him? versus the way they engaged and built relationship with him and that enabled him to take a journey that led him to be a big supporter of these efforts. And, and so I think there's this thing that we have to think about of like, how do we bring people along? And I think, you know, to another former speaker, thinking of empathy and Brene Brown, we approach it and thinking of uh, grace, but also not, it's not everybody's work to do that. And that's something that's really important. Um, but I think we have to think about how we build allies, how we help people along, how we make sure I've spoken in small rural communities where I've had a few different people come to me. We've never, you know, I know a lot of people here don't talk like about these things, but I'm so glad you're here. I'm like, why aren't you talking to each other, right? Like find your allies, build more allies, do it through story, do it through your example, do it through how you got there. Stand up, and, and that still means standing up when it's important to stand up and when there's issues in the community, being a voice for everyone belonging in the democracy, for everyone belonging in the community, not standing down from that or hiding that, being out there, but also finding ways to do that in ways that can build allies instead of just get recognized and rewarded by those who are already there. And um, the last thing I want to share is my, my partner, Dominique Samari, has a thing called Kin Universe, but what Dominique's really learned is she does this relationship building process where people have to have five different conversations mm -hmm. that are more personal, and then the sixth goes into race. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole process by which they choose how they're going to talk about it. But her point is that build the relationship and then go there versus start the relationship there. And so I think we just have to really think of the relational at the local level and think about goal. And I've seen a lot of people come into it again 
want to be recognized for being a leader on it without doing the things that can actually build allies and support and partners at a local level where a lot of people just don't know. And you can actually bring people along through your own example of how you've gotten there. Thank you, Paul. Um, I just want to note for everyone, this session is scheduled to end at the top of the hour, and I'm going to ask forgiveness if we can run about 10 minutes long, because I really want to ask a couple more questions to Monique, Junius, and Paul. You will still get a 20-minute break before your next session, I promise. Um, so thank you for your forgiveness. Um, Monique, would you like to add in here? I'll add a tiny bit, actually, because... Um... What Paul said made me think of two things, you know, um, and this is not to be reductive. None of this, none of this can ever be reduced or boiled down to any simplistic idea, notion or strategy. I just think it's so important um, that what Paul is talking about in our relational work is centering our humanity, seeing each other's humanity, holding each other's humanity in a way that is antithetical to culturally how these laws and policies have served to fracture and disconnect us from being able to hold, see, and center each other's humanity. And so I it just, it feels important to name that because sometimes we get super technical in our strategies or we're holding the complexity of how adaptive the challenge is and how we need to be responsive in a very complex way. But sometimes at the very, very core of this is our ability to see and connect in our most human and fundamental ways. And I imagine and dream of what our democracy won't just look like, but what it will feel like when we can hold each other in the intimacy of each other in such some such such a simplistic, necessary healing, intergenerationally healing way. And and you know, again, you know, everything Junior said about the, you know, organizing, being prepared to sue, being prepared for the legal fight to take it to the courts. I also think we must not forget that this is cultural change work we're doing, cultural strategy work that we're doing, which really is also about narrative change and narrative strategy, because part also of what Paul was talking about is this zero sum. The idea, we know this, right? That if somebody's winning, somebody else is losing. So we can, we should, we need to get super tactical on our legal strategies. We need to get clear on our messaging, that campaigning, policy advocacy. All of that is really important, coupled with let's not forget to see and hold in really um, sensitive, empathetic ways each other's humanity. And then let's get really clear on the cultural strategies and narrative strategies that help us to not just tell different stories, but the shifting of our hearts and minds that lead to different stories. It's beautiful to hear that first you have like four conversations on being human before you then talk about the, the very constructs that by design, fracture, divide us. They serve to other, they serve to do the opposite of bridging, right? The breaking that John Powell teaches us. And so anyway, that, that's what I would add to what Paul has shared. Thank you, Thank you Monique. Lots of, lots of love for that in the chat, in the, the emojis. Um, one of the things I just want to give a moment of attention to is we've been talking largely about how collaboratives, collective impact efforts can show up and move this work forward. And these kind of efforts are one piece of the broader landscape. And this has come up in bits and pieces, but I just wanted to ask a little bit more clearly um, what you would encourage folks working in collective impact to do in terms of connecting with the broader justice ecosystem. So movement, organizers, base builders, legal work, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Junius, I'd love to get your perspective on how these efforts should coordinate and collaborate with other strategies in their place. Um, well, a couple of things. I think you need to really be careful, right? If you're a backbone uh, organization, most of you probably uh, experienced uh, this, that folks around a collaborative table form uh, this concept that you're kind of aligned on everything, right? And so while the collaborative may take a certain uh, position with respect to how they're going to address equity either initially or on a continuing uh, uh, basis, um, 
you've got to make some decisions if it's not satisfactory in terms of how you want to show up in the work. Uh, the, what gets problematic is the identification of some of us who are leaders in collaborative tables that may constrain it. So I, I guess I start with the point that you need to be really careful uh, as you wade into the broader community around what impact, where you position yourselves around the equity issues are gonna impact what happens at your collaborative table. It's not to say you shouldn't do it, but you should just be aware. I think the broader thing is I do, or as you do your, your kind of personal, your organizational, your collaborative and your community sort of assessment of, of where you're gonna go and how you're gonna try uh, uh, to do the equity work, you may get constrained, as I was saying. The collaborative may say, no, we need to back off, uh, hold up a little bit, not pursue something. I think individual members of the collaborative and especially the backbone and the leadership need to be careful about how they uh, make their, how they do their personal work around equity in the same community. And I'm just saying that people get confused, right? If you're in too many positions about whether you're representing the collaborative or the individual action. I think Jen's broader point though is a good one, is that there are certain things that cannot be pushed these through these collaboratives. A quick example, we had a, a re-entry collaborative uh, table in Oakland that never got anything done uh, around policy and systems change because the whole uh, criminal law uh, infrastructure was at the table and they didn't want to change anything. What we ended up saying is we can't do it there. We'll stay at that table and move it as we can but what we need is we need our own table to move this work. Now in Oakland and Alameda County, we were able to do that and we created the Justice Reinvestment Coalition, which was able to kick ass on criminal law reform issues, not constrained by the fact that corrections department and the police jurisdictions and that whole establishment didn't want to see anything change except a little program dabbling. So I just say that to say you need to make some strategic decisions. Where are the people you're connected with willing to go on it? How does that jive with whether you organizationally, individually, or as a member of the community want to go and navigating that carefully because your identity with the collaborative may carry around with you and send uh, messages that hurt your collaborative work. All right, so I want to be sure we get to at least one audience question. Um, and I know that we promised only 10 minutes long. Um, so I'm well, I'm gonna ask a clarifying question and then a conceptual question from the audience. So the and I'm gonna ask them both. Um, Junius, you had um, mentioned not to use the word identities when talking about, uh, my response to disaggregated data and several folks wanted to understand why and what a recommended alternate term would be. So I'll, we'll take that for a hopefully quicker answer and then I'll ask a bigger question. Uh, yeah, because identities is charged and it's part of the cultural warfare. And if you go there, you're going into that conversation. I tend to say uh, demographic characteristics of the population. I do something soft that is very inclusive of everything. That can be from geography to identities. It's all there, but you don't focus on identities, which is a flashpoint. Very practical. Thank you. Um, so folks are uh, appreciate the reference to targeted universalism. And I know all of all three of you really um, look toward that methodology. And someone asks, um, what if folks, when you recognize and take a targeted universal approach, still see this as equity or a DEI angle and push back on it or remove themselves from the conversation when they even hear targeted universalism? What would you advise? Do you want to lead off, Monique? Uh, sure. Um, so I have to say that I have two thoughts. The, what, I, what I've been thinking, what's been building up in me that I think I've been speaking to it, uh, in some ways is 
that's why I act what Paul said, being really clear about our goal is important because then this is a semantics fight. You're fighting over language, but this is not really what the fight is, right? This is a fight over the future of our democracy, who belongs in our democracy. So that feels just really important as a disclaimer um, because the culture war is, is this ongoing war that is so often fought around language. And what I, so, so that's my first thought. But my second thought around target universalism, and maybe for some places that's a non-starter, I have two thoughts. I think the first is, and we see this in some of our communities, you continue work with the people who are willing to do the work. And that's why it's really important that at least in our network, we have communities doing work and communities are tethered to state networks. And so you really are able to have this multi-pronged strategy that is about helping you build allies in different places when language is a barrier locally that can't move the agenda. The other thing though that I do wanna say is that in Communities across our network use a range of strategies. I lifted up some of what's happening in Texas, but for places where this is completely a non-starter, the conversation is about mental health and mental health is a way in to being able to do this work more broadly. Sometimes the conversation, I'm thinking of Del Norte, uh, Native and Tribal Lands, the conversation, there was a conversation about healing. Uh, so, so based on where you are, based on context, based on public will, you do have to be creative about where you might want to start to be able to meaningfully move the agenda. But let's not forget that even in our local fighting efforts, we have to be tethered to broader coalitions that help us move different levers at different times in different ways. That's really helpful, Monique, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to recognize that, that you know, in the chat and questions we've shared the UC Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute's website on targeted universalism, but also the article uh, many of us worked on for the forum uh, on centering equity and collective impact and the toolkit that collective impact efforts can use to actually try to has practices for implementing it through your coalition and your effort, which includes a section in both the article and the toolkit on kind of the data and target universalism piece. And so just encourage people, those links are are available. And I think that uh, um, I would encourage people to really dig into all three as, as places to go for more information and learning. Thank and I agree you. with everything Monique said. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I'd make two quick points. One of which is that Part of the the strategy in using targeted universalism is that ultimately you get down to the individual case, right? Because you're going to do something for people who are experiencing diversity. It It is inconsistent with helping people to ignore who they are, right? And I have trouble figuring out a way that people, once you get everything framed, uh, keep in mind that you don't you don't ever exclude anyone from any intervention, no matter how targeted it is. We had manhood development programs in Oakland that started with one for black males. Then we did uh, Latinos. Then we uh, did native folks. And then we did Asian. So everybody had one. Nobody could discriminate. So if I, as a white, young white male, wanted to go to the black male achievement program, I was totally free and not only free to go there, but I was welcome there because I was expressing an interest in Black culture and knew the environment. So I'm saying that's an important part of this, is you're not restricting anything. And what you're doing is saying, what are the needs of this individual, right? And we've got this panoply of strategies and interventions that we're going to fit to the needs of this individual. I think it's very hard for people to impose... Um, uh, these uh, arguments about you being racist. You don't want me to fully serve this individual. I don't care who they are. They're eligible for everything we have. And I'm looking at their individual circumstance to get the best individualized uh, set of strategies to help them achieve the outcomes that they want in their life. Y'all, thank you. Um, I... As I said, when I opened, you are amazing. You are mentors to me and now to all 300 plus folks on the line getting to benefit from your reflections, your wisdom, and your brilliance. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Um, I know I anticipate many folks want to continue to learn with you. So uh, please, y'all see these folks as experts. And also, I will reflect that they are also big learners and want to keep learning with you also. So please, um, from all of us at the forum and the extended forum family, please share with us what's happening in your communities and how you all are responding to. So we appreciate um, Monique, Junius, Paul. Thank you. Carrie and Jesse, thank you. Um, and 